in the last video we had a discussion and that discussion was about PCR and how we can use PCR to identify if certain genetic markers that are very common in genetically modified plants uh, are showing up and it's as simple as analyzing it uh, per sample and crossing it with a positive that we know is for certain GMO. Uh, and we talked about how to use PCR and how to use electrophoresis and really how DNA is a little bit structured in the last video. And in this video what I want to do is talk about how this is actually accomplished. Now uh, what you see on the screen uh, notice that we looked for something called CMV35S and NOS Terminator. It is very common in the genetic engineering world to um, have this reaction, I guess you could say, uh, to focus in on a certain piece of the DNA that we want to know more about or that we want to study or that we want to splice. Okay, So in order to do this, we have to give it targets. And we have a handful of targets that allow this to happen. The CMV, which is that cauliflower mosaic virus, and the NOS terminator is basically a flag. And the flag is set at one end, a goalpost, and it's set at the other end, another goalpost. And this activates and terminates the sequence area that we want to maybe copy or that we want to uh, genetically splice into an organism and so forth. So there are very common activators and promoters and terminators that are out there. And that's why we look at some of these. And that's why PCR kind of works. It's only one of the things that we can do, not the only option, but it is one of the easiest and it's probably one of the easiest to kind of present to you as well. Now, how is this accomplished? Uh, we talked in the last video about how to determine if that item is genetically modified. Okay, But what if I was given the role to genetically modify it? How do I do that on the other end? Okay, well, I use a gun, literally. Okay, This gun is a laboratory gun, and this gun is filled with helium. That is the propellant. That is what makes this gun shoot. This helium is very high pressure. So we're talking about 1,000 plus pressure per square inch. Now a typical tire on your vehicle is around 40 PSI. Of course that depends on your tire. But on average we're looking at 40, 35 to 40. Okay, well this is 1,000. So you can imagine the amount of pressure that gets built up on the inside of these things. Well, at the end of the gun, where the nozzle would be, we would see a very thin film of gold. And on that gold, we have coated it with DNA that we would like to insert into that object. Literally, that's what we do. It is a gold-plated DNA disc. All right, so this helium shoots out from this gun. The gold disc doesn't go anywhere, okay? It doesn't go and bombard into here. The disc is actually stopped by a screen, a protector mechanism here at the very end. However, this gold is creating a surface that this DNA can set on until the helium comes by, and then the helium basically whoosh, pushes all of those DNA particles out of the screen. All right. Now, there is a chance that some of the gold particles also make their way into the plant. It's not going to stop everything. But what we're hoping for is like a shotgun. We hope that something's going to hit. Now, the problem here is that we have to look at individual cells. And the reason that we load it down with so many DNA particles is because we can't really guarantee that the first shot is going to take. Meaning that what has to happen here is that inside of the plant cell, there is a cluster of DNA. That's where the DNA is held. Well, if we shoot that DNA particle that we want to insert into the plant, into the plant cell, 
If it doesn't quite make it to the area where DNA is made and stored and replicated, it's not going to do us any good. It might be in the plant cell, great, but that's only the number one thing that has to happen. The number two thing is that it has to make its way inside of the DNA chamber or the DNA safe, the nucleus, right? So if it does not stop in the nucleus, just so perfect, the little Goldilocks particle, not too far in, not too far out, not too far to the left, not too far to the right, just perfect. Then we cross our fingers again and we hope that the plant will uptake that DNA and begin to slightly change, give us the trait that we are after. This is called the gene gun. A gene gun has made its way over the course of years. The face of a gene gun has changed from what it used to look like to what it looks like now. And another term that comes along with this is called particle bombardment. Two terms representing the same thing. Well, here's a gene gun at work. Right? So as you can tell, this is a handheld device with a cartridge of helium, kind of. And down here are the gold particles that are coated in that DNA. And here we have our specimen. That specimen is just a simple little leaf. And we just press the plunger against the leaf surface and we pull the trigger. Some of the cells will uptake that DNA, some of the cells will not. And again, it's like a game of roulette. We just got to figure out if it did, and if so, how much. And then hopefully, the plant will do what we want it to do from that point on. Folks, that's it. Now, there used to be tabletop versions of this. All right, so here's a tabletop version. You can kind of see it's not as portable, but it's the same concept. There's no difference. Helium glass, gas, a plastic disc shoot the DNA into the cells, and we cross our fingers. So these gene guns are becoming more and more common in the world of genetic engineering. And as you can imagine, there's multiple tests that have to be done on these products. So there's multiple rounds of genetic splicing and genetic insertion that we have to do. So we need something very easy that will allow this to happen. And this is one of those ways. Again, not the only way, but it's one of these ways. Let's talk about genetic modification for a minute. All right, what you see on the image here is a plant. Here's a crop. And this crop is plagued by an insect. That insect is gonna come around, it's gonna eat, 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 yum, 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 yum. Look at his little knife and his little fork, right? He's very happy. He's going to get his belly full. So I kept saying that some of these crops are insecticide, built in, right? They make their own, kind of. But how is that really done? Because when this little guy with his little happy face and a fork and a knife sits down to have dinner, he's going to eat, and then his stomach's going to hurt. He's He's dead. The reason that he's dead is because he munched in onto a leaf. And the reason that he munched into the leaf is because he thought it tasted good. That was his normal food product. And then when he bit down into it, that leaf actually had an internal poison for him. So the insides bursted open and, he did, and he's dead. Poor thing. Well, one of the ways that we do this is through an organism. And this organism is called Bacillus thuringiensis, BT. That is the abbreviation that's used for that. The reason that this bacteria kind of is used is because we notice very early on that this bacteria can go into a plant and this bacteria can change the plant activity. What happens is that this bacteria has DNA on the inside of it. And the way that this mechanism works is this bacteria will infect the host and then it will 
squirt out its DNA into the plant. The reason that it does this is because naturally this is the way it grows and this is the way it eats. The Bt will infect the host with its own DNA. That DNA will go into a plant cell and it will change that plant cell. Normally what happens is that it promotes the plant cells to multiply and to grow. And Bt sometimes will set up tumors on the plants when it infects them. The reason is that these cells are constantly multiplying and these cells are constantly growing and the plant cannot kill it off. It's just like a cancer or a tumor that a person would get. Your body does not kill off those cells. They do not know when to die. Normally, we slosh cells off all the time, but not when Bt is involved. In that DNA, the reason that it works is because it changes the plant to make basically protein or a food source that will then give, be given back to this bacteria. Folks, this is a natural gene modifier in the form of a bacteria. And if we can take this bacteria into a lab, and if we can change the DNA of that bacteria, then that bacteria can go into the plant and do what it normally does, infect the host, make it do something different, and then reap the benefits of it. And that's what you're seeing here. A BT gene is inserted into the crop. This BT gene could carry with it whatever we want to add on to the mix. And we allow BT to do the work. That work could be a built-in glyphosate-resistant crop. Something like this bacteria can help us out with that. Here's another image, again concerning BT. Bacillus thuringiensis. So one of the pests that a corn stalk would have would be a poor little old caterpillar. Poor thing. They make butterflies. Oh, butterflies were on the non-GMO label, and here we're going to kill it. Hmm, I wonder if that has anything to do with it. Corn plants are destroyed by the butterfly larvae. Caterpillars, you know them as. We're going to kill them out. We don't want those caterpillars to destroy the corn crop because we have so many consumer products that are based on corn. So we got to kill the caterpillars. Poor little things. They can go somewhere else and eat, not on the corn crop. All right, so what happens is that we take BT, and this BT, we know how it operates, we know how it works. BT on the inside has two different types of DNA. This is the DNA of that bacteria, and this is what we would call the plasmid. Plasmids are typically represented as a circle. Okay, this is something that's very common in the world of bacteria and stuff. You have this circular DNA that we would call a plasmid. It is separate from the normal DNA. It's held in a different area than the normal DNA is, and that's why they're drawing it both here. All right, so we take and we look at certain areas of the DNA of the BT, and what we do is that we insert that into the genome or into the genetics that will then eventually go in to the plant cell. So when that goes into the plant cell, we now create a poison environment on the inside that targets those caterpillars and uh -uh, poor little caterpillar's dead. You eat it, you eat that bacterial gene you could eat that insecticide, but it's not going to have any effect on you because you're not an insect, right? This is one of the ways that modification can happen. Here's another image, just a little bit more detail. Notice up here at the top, this is going to target agrobacterium, all right? Another very common uh, thing that's used in genetic engineering. 
Well, notice the way that they've drawn the bacteria. They have DNA squirmy over here, and then they have the plasma DNA to the left. So they're going to focus on this plasma DNA right here, this circular DNA strand. And they're going to isolate what we call tDNA. And tDNA, the T stands for transfer. All right, so you probably know what we want to do with this. All right. Notice they've also included a restriction cleavage site. Right here, if you look at that transfer DNA, there is an area that is crooked. You remember that lecture about EcoR1? This is a way that we can cut DNA, not bluntly, but have it a sticky jagged end that we can then do something with. So this plasmid is removed from the bacteria, and in this case it's agrobacterium. The tDNA is cut by a restriction enzyme. And then over on the other side of the house at number two, we have foreign DNA that was not part of that bacteria. That foreign DNA is also cut by the same enzyme. That way our cutting is going to be the same. Number three, this foreign DNA that we want to insert is then placed on that transfer DNA area. And the bacteria, we hope, takes it up. It repairs itself. Then this modified DNA strand goes back into the bacteria and that bacteria will begin to replicate that genetic code that we've just given it. Number five, that bacteria is then used to infect. That's basically what we're doing. And it will infect those host cells. It will take its DNA like it normally wants to do, and it squirts it into basically the host cell where this thing can continue to replicate. This is normally done in a petri dish in the very beginning if we're doing studies with it in the laboratory. That way we can monitor it, we can measure it, we can ensure that these cells have uptaken that transfer DNA that we wanted to give it. Number six, the plant cells are grown in culture. That's what that means. And then number seven, a new plant is now born. It carries with it the cells or the genes, the DNA fragments, that we wanted to give it in the very beginning. Folks, this is just an intro to genetic engineering. That's all that this is. No specifics, no details, but it gives you an idea of how this process is taking place in a lab. It is a completely different world. Biotechnology, genetic engineering, and I often call them users because they're using everything around them. They are using that poor little bacteria to do its job and they modify and they persuade it to do something that it didn't do before. They are using that bacteria to infect a host and they're using those plant cells that are already there doing their job, minding their own business to do something else that they want them to do not that the plant wants to do. Again, this is an issue for some people. Genetic modification, this concept of gene splicing, taking bacteria, adding DNA to it, allowing the bacteria to replicate, allowing bacteria to infect a plant cell, and then have that plant turn out completely different than what it was before? This is the issue of genetic modified foods that people are not comfortable with. And to the untrained eye, to people who are unaware of really what goes on in a laboratory, you can see how this seems somewhat strange. Notice I said back here with the gene gun, we have to hope. We have to hope that that genetic uptake happens. Well, when we modify, we have to hope. 
we have to hope that that genetic modification happens as well. There's another technique out there too. Do you know what they do? They take a plant cell that's currently growing or stem, then they take a knife and they coat the knife with all of the gunky bacteria that carries that genetic code and then they take it over to this plant and they just cut it. When they do that, they are disturbing the plant cells. This is another way that they could infect those plants and persuade them to uptake the new DNA from that bacteria. Imagine. Again, all those people that go to Trader Joe's and Whole Foods, all organic, nothing chemical related, no pesticide, no herbicides. Imagine their faces if you told them that your job is to take bacteria, infect it with DNA, cut plants in a laboratory, insert that bacteria's DNA into the plant, hoping that this plant will change from here on out because it has a new DNA sequence that it wants to copy. Now you see the issue. But this modification, this modification led to longer lasting produce. This modification led to rice, of all things, having higher vitamin A content to prevent that blindness and all those other health issues that came along with it. This type of technique is meant to encourage and streamline productivity and consumer usage, fruit, vegetable, produce areas. If it wasn't for this, where would the world's food supply be today? Because we've already discussed that without this splicing, without any of this stuff going on, we could have had a food shortage. We're making plants that produce more fruit, more flour. If it wasn't for that, we would need more acres. Who has the land? Who has hundreds of thousands of acres that we could utilize to grow crops with to meet the needs of the world's food supply? Genetic engineering stepped into that role, and genetic engineering helped lower the burden off of this idea that we were running out of space for farmland. We couldn't produce enough food that everyone needed. So genetic modification solved it in a different way. Genetic modification allowed us to go in, produce plants that would give us longer lasting produce, Bigger, better, taste better, just simply by cutting a plant with a knife. But how far is too far? That's always the question. That will always be the question of biotechnology and genetic engineering. Where do you put a stop to it? And until that point happens, who knows what we'll end up with? I mean, sometimes I feel like this. Sometimes you might look like this. These poor little produce, fruits and vegetables, they might have feelings too. Maybe we need to ask them what they would like. So in this next slide, you're going to see a couple of links. Uh, these links are going to be YouTube videos that I would like for you to watch. In the next video, I'm going to click on each one of these. So that way you can watch them in one video at one time and that's it. But I'm also going to post the individual links to them so that way you have another way that you can access them. So in this next video that you're going to get from me, the only thing that I'm going to do is click on these links. I'm going to record the videos for you to watch all in one big long video so that way they're all conveniently stored in the same place. But I'm also going to put these links in the Blackboard side as well. So, you make the determination on what you want to do and how you want to watch them, but make sure that you view them. 
because again, test questions and quiz questions can come from these. It's very important. They give some great information. You'll see some people actually in a genetic engineering lab doing their job. And you'll see that it doesn't look very difficult, really, compared to what you've been doing. So this is where my lecture is going to stop on genetically modified organisms or GMOs. And hopefully this gives you a little bit more information about GM, about what GM actually means and how they do it and how we test for it in a lab. And after watching these external videos, I'll think that you'll walk away with a better understanding even on top of that. So good luck with the module, good luck with the assignments, good luck with the laboratory experiment that pairs up with this. Again, I don't think that you'll need it, but if you have questions, you know where to find me. So hopefully I've made some of you out to be a farmer. It doesn't take a lot of farmland. Go grab you a zucchini plant. Go grab you a basil plant or something. Put it into a pot. Put it into your apartment. Put it into your backyard. You might surprise yourself, actually, from what you can do. Good luck.